I'm Sean Elliott, Associate Professor of Urology at the University of Minnesota and a specialist in urologic reconstruction. Today I'll discuss with you troubleshooting complications of continent urinary diversion. This presentation was put together with Drs. Jeremy Myers, John Stoffel, and Daniel Rosenstein. Dr. Myers, Dr. Stoffel, and myself are members of the Neurogenic Bladder Research Group. Although a basic understanding of continent urinary diversion is helpful in understanding this presentation on troubleshooting complications of urinary diversion, it is not essential, and we will cover some of the basics of continent urinary diversion. This presentation is organized as two cases, first one on channel stenosis and the second on channel incontinence. We've presented this before as a roundtable discussion where I reviewed the cases and the other three members of the panel uh, responded to questions that I posed. In this version of the presentation today, I'll be posing the questions and I'll be responding with the answers. The first case is of channel stenosis, a 54-year-old man with a T4 spinal cord injury in 1992, secondary to a motor vehicle accident, presents to you with channel stenosis. He has a history of an augment and an appendiceal metrophenoff in 2000. He recalls the metrophenoff being dilated in clinic a few times in the past before he established care with you. He has no recent urologic follow-up. He is unable to catheterize his channel now for several months, and he's been catheterizing preurethra about two times per day. He has no history of stomal or urethral incontinence. On examination, he's not obese. He has a laparotomy scar from the xiphoid to the pubis. There's a metrophenoff stoma at the umbilicus, but it's quite stenotic. Renal ultrasound is normal. So the first question posed is, what is the epidemiology and what are the risk factors for continent channel stenosis? Stenosis occurs in about 10 to 30 percent of continent channels. The frequency of stenosis varies by one's definition of stenosis and the length of follow-up. Let me explain. Stenosis is sometimes defined as any difficulty catheterizing the channel, other times by any need for channel dilation, and other times by any need for channel revision surgery. So as you might guess, the frequency of channel stenosis varies in the literature. The frequency of channel stenosis also depends on the length of follow-up, and unfortunately the length of follow-up is limited in most series. Risk factors of channel stenosis can be understood in two categories. First, early risk factors and second, late risk factors. Early risk factors are believed to include poor vascular supply to the channel, wound infection, skin irritation, and inadequate spatulation. Late risk factors include repetitive trauma from catheterizing the stoma several times every day, and obesity. Stomal location does not appear to be predictive of the risk of channel stenosis. Whether the channel has been located on the lower abdominal wall or at the umbilicus, revision rates appear to be similar, yet there remain strong proponents of both options. Similarly, the literature is conflicted as to whether the appendix versus ileal channels have higher rates of stomal stenosis. Overall, the risk of stomal stenosis appears similar between appendiceal metrophenoff and ileal monte, although some series would suggest a higher rate of stenosis with a spiral monte. So in this patient, our 54-year-old man with a spinal cord injury and stomal stenosis at the skin level, or at least it appears to our eyes so far to be at the skin level, what should be our first intervention? We try to go with the least invasive option first, 
and so we reach for channel dilation. A channel can be dilated by successively dilating it up in the clinic either with uh, serial catheters starting with a small one perhaps over a wire and then moving up to larger catheters. Once you're able to get the channel up to a reasonable size we'll frequently leave a catheter in for a week or two weeks and then if the channel stenosis appears to be recurrent we can leave an L stent in the channel. There's a picture of the L stent here. It's essentially about one-third the length of a total catheter to one-half the length of a total catheter such that it's about two inches long on either side of a knot tied into the catheter. This knot creates a right angle in the catheter and allows for the distal portion to be inserted into the channel and that distal portion is too short to reach down into the bladder so that there's no contact with the bladder and thus no urinary leakage and a lower risk of urinary tract infection. The proximal end that is the part that is outside of the body and this can be taped onto the patient's abdomen to keep the catheter from falling out. Several patients will wear this L stent in overnight to help manage channel stenosis and go without the L stent during the day and then in the worst case scenario some patients will wear the L stent all day long removing it only to catheterize. In a series with just a few patients, the L-stent has been shown to be rather successful. For our patient, we started with channel dilation, first inserting a guide wire and then dilating him up easily with a 12 French and then 14 French catheter. We removed the catheter one week later and re he resumed intermittent catheterization. Unfortunately, he returns two weeks later with inability to catheterize the channel. So what should be our next step once dilation has failed? Well, when dilation fails, we think about surgical management of stomal stenosis. One option is an advancement flap. This is essentially a YV plasty. So a full thickness V flap is raised of the skin adjacent to the stoma and then the stoma is resected back to healthy tissue and spatulated and then this V-flap is advanced down into the stoma as a YV plasty. This is commonly the first procedure surgeons reach to when they revise a channel for stomal stenosis but there is really no long-term data on efficacy. A once described but rarely practiced alternative is buccal mucosa grafting for channel stenosis. Similarly, a procedure that's been described but to our knowledge is rarely used for the most difficult cases is a tube of skin created using two V flaps that are then rolled together, tubularized, and advanced down towards the end of the uh, metrophenoff that's been spatulated. A YB plasty was indeed performed for our patient and it worked well for him for some time but then one year later he returns unable to catheterize his channel. So we ask what next when dilation has failed and a YV plasty has failed are we looking at another surgery? Indeed when these other measures have failed we're going to have to do a laparotomy and revise his channel or remove and replace his channel. When we do that, we'll need good familiarity with the different options for channel construction when the appendix is absent. In this particular patient, his appendix was used for his previous channel creation, and so when we revise that channel through a laparotomy, we may need to add some additional length to that channel or completely replace it with one of the channels pictured here. First, we can perform a Monty. This is where a segment of ilium, generally about two centimeters, is opened along its anti-mesenteric border and then closed transversely to create about a seven centimeter tube. In adults, this is frequently not long enough and so commonly performed procedures 
include the double Monty, where two tubes of 2 centimeter ilium are reconfigured into a 14 centimeter channel, or the spiral Monty, configured out of a 3.5 centimeter segment of ilium that is opened in a Z fashion and then closed, yielding a 12 to 14 centimeter channel, or another option is tapered ilium, where the desired length of ilium is harvested completely and then that length of ilium is tapered over a catheter. Tapering can be done along the anti-mesenteric border using either a stapler or excision of that bowel and then closing it with sutures. Advantages and disadvantages to each of these procedures must be understood. The spiral monte yields the most tenuous blood supply. The double monte is hampered by difficulty with catheterization at the anastomosis between the two monte ends, and the tapered ilium can be hampered by its very large mesentery, which can get in the way of either tunneling this channel into the bladder or bringing it up to the skin. In longer channels, the mesentery can result in bowing or arcing of the channel, making it difficult to catheterize. A couple of procedures that have been described but are rarely used are ones that avoid harvesting any bowel when trying to create a catheterizable channel. These both involve making a stoma just out of skin and bladder. Uh, one involves creating an extravesical bladder tube, similar to a Boari flap, and then anastomosing that up to the skin. An intravesical flap valve is created for continence, and the other involves a skin tube that's advanced down towards the bladder and the use of a rectus muscle wrap for continence. Both of these have not had excellent results in the literature and are not used very often. In our particular patient, a laparotomy was performed and a four-hour lysis of adhesions ensued. We discovered an enterostomal fistula to the small bowel. This was excised, both the fistula and the involved section of the channel and the involved section of the small bowel. This resulted in us excising the channel at the distal end, but being able to preserve the bladder end of the metrophenoff. We had about a 10 centimeter gap between the bladder end of the metrophenoff and the umbilicus, and we elected to bridge this gap with a 10 centimeter segment of tapered ileum from one end of the previously resected ileum from earlier in the case. We tapered this ileum using a stapler over a catheter. And as you can see in the picture here, paying attention to the lower arrow and the blow up on the right, we were able to anastomose one end of this channel to the bladder end of his metrophenoff and then the other end up to the skin. You can see the staple taper line. You can see the interrupted PDS sutures between the new channel and the old channel. You can see the catheter exiting 16 French in size in the left-hand panel. In follow-up one year later, he's catheterizing without trouble, and he's continent of urine. So to review our management of channel stenosis, we first want to know is that stenosis at the skin or deeper inside, and we perform a dilation, usually just in the office. We can do this by gaining access with a wire and then passing a series of catheters over that wire, starting with a rather small catheter like 8 or 10 French and moving up to the size that the patient generally catheterizes with. We find it best to use stiff catheters. We leave that catheter in for about two weeks and then have them resume catheterization. If this becomes a recurrent problem, then we may place an L stent in order to manage the stenosis non-operatively. When the L stent is not tolerated or the channel stenosis is refractory to management with an L stent, then we consider surgical revision. If the stenosis is limited to just the stoma, that is, it's superficial, 
then we can perform a YV plasty above the fascia or occasionally have to make a mini laparotomy to mobilize the terminal end of the stoma up towards the skin in order to achieve a tension-free YV plasty. When the stenosis is longer or deeper inside the channel, then we need to perform a full laparotomy and we'll have to excise the involved portion and replace some or all of the channel with a new bowel segment. I should say that in rare circumstances we've been able to just excise a portion of the channel and perform an end-to-end -end anastomosis of the existing channel, preserving the blood supply in both ends, but generally the blood supply to one end will be affected and a portion of it will have to be removed and replaced with a new channel with a new blood supply. When you think about the benefits of preserving part of the channel, it's particularly helpful if the continent end of the channel can be preserved, that is, the end towards the bladder. Then we do not have to make a new continence mechanism, and we can simply add a new terminal end to the channel and mature that up to the umbilicus. But if the continence mechanism is affected by the stenosis, then we'll likely have to remove all of the channel and create a new channel with a new continence mechanism. The second case is an example of channel incontinence. A 37-year-old man with cerebral palsy and urinary retention performs clean intermittent catheterization per urethra, but that's becoming increasingly difficult. The systematogram demonstrates a low-pressure, high-capacity bladder with no detrusor overactivity. Therefore, he decides to proceed with creation of a catheterizable channel to his abdominal wall to ease intermittent catheterization. Because of the length between his native bladder and the umbilicus, a spiral Monte Yang channel is created with a 4 centimeter detrusor tunnel. Postoperatively, there's stenosis of the umbilical opening, and it can only accept a 12 French catheter. Sometimes the patient has difficulty inserting the catheter, and other times he forgets to catheterize and so he develops bladder over distension from poor drainage. Eventually there's leakage from the stoma and this leakage does not improve with an anticholinergic. So the question is what is the approach to channel incontinence? When we think about channel incontinence we want to think about the different possible etiologies. You can think of this in three categories. First is bladder problems, second is problems with the continence mechanism, and third is patient factors. So first, the bladder issues would include poor bladder compliance, poor bladder capacity, or detrusor overactivity. Urodynamic studies can help confirm this, and medical or surgical therapy will be discussed in the upcoming slides. If the problem was with the channel continence mechanism, this can be confirmed by either history, physical exam, or urodynamics. And finally, problems with patient uh, compliance can include forgetting to catheterize or delaying catheterization. This leads to bladder over distension and eventually overflow incontinence. In some cases, prolonged periods of retention and overflow incontinence can lead to relaxing of the continence mechanism. First, we'll discuss the management options for poor bladder compliance or reduced bladder capacity. These include antimuscarinic therapy, intravesical botulinum toxin injection, or for refractory cases, bladder augmentation. Second, the inadequate channel continence mechanism can be dealt with through a variety of surgical means from minimally invasive to maximally invasive. Minimally invasive methods include bulking agent injection into the valve, and then more invasive methods include revising the flat valve through detrusorophy, although this has limited success. More experimental methods like erectus abdominis muscle wrap around the channel, creating a neosphincter, or channel revision. Much of the rest of this talk will focus on channel revision. 
In our particular case of Monty Yang Channel Incontinence, minimally invasive therapy was pursued through bulking agent injection. You can see here in panel A the appearance of the continence mechanism before bulking agent injection, the appearance of the continence mechanism in panel B during injection. In fact, you can see the needle at the 6 o'clock position. And then in panel C, you see the final result after the bulking agent has been injected. So what is the evidence basis for bulking agent injection into the channel? There's limited evidence in the literature, and most of this has been in children. In fact, in one of the first and largest series by Pareto et al., 14 children underwent bulking agent injection. This was done in an antegrade fashion, meaning that a small, rigid pediatric scope was inserted through the stoma down to the continence mechanism, and then the bulking agent was injected into the mucosus of the continent channel. Either a suprapubic tube or a urethral catheter was inserted, or intermittent catheterization was done through the urethra such that nothing passed through the catheterizable channel for 10 to 14 days. 71% were dry at a mean of one year. Other series have not had as much success. After our patient underwent bulking agent injection, he had increased difficulty with catheterizing and continued incontinence from the stoma. In fact, he had several trips to the emergency room for inability to catheterize his channel. On exam, everything is still consistent with stress incontinence through his channel. We did not repeat urodynamics, but these previously showed a low pressure bladder. What would be the next steps? Surgical options beyond the rectus muscle wrap or detrusorophy that were briefly discussed earlier would include replacing the channel and making a new continence mechanism. One could create a new tunneled channel with a Monte Yang tapered ileum or appendix if the bladder appears to be good for tunneling. This could be used with or without injection of onobotulinum toxin A. But if the bladder is not good for creating a tunnel, then an alternative continence mechanism can be created that does not rely on the detrusor flap valve. In adult neurogenic bladder, we encounter several scenarios where the bladder does not appear to be good for tunneling. These include a small contracted bladder that is a long distance from the abdominal wall, or a bladder with a chronically inflamed mucosa or detrusor muscle. Options for creating a new continence mechanism include the Ghanaim serosal lined flap valve or the hydraulic intussuscepted valve as in the Skinner T pouch, although both of these are rarely used. A third option, which is much more reproducible and technically straightforward, is creation of a continent cutaneous ileal channel cecocystoplasty or the CCIC. This is alternatively known as the hemi-Indiana pouch. As with the classic Indiana pouch, an ileocecal segment is harvested, and then the cecal end is detubularized and then added to the bladder. The length used from the right colon can vary depending on the amount of augment that is desired. In some cases, you only need the continence mechanism and so a minimal amount of cecum can be harvested. In other cases, a larger augment might be needed and you could harvest 15 to 20 centimeters of the right colon. These surgical images demonstrate the steps of the procedure in detail. First, the cecum and the terminal ileum are isolated. Second, the cecum is detubularized along its anti-mesenteric border. Note the cecal side of the ileocecal valve present in the middle of our augment section. Third, the ileum is tapered over a catheter. Notice how the staple is running along the anti-mesenteric border of the ileum, and Babcock clamps are used to grab onto and hold up the anti-mesenteric border of that ileum. Note how the catheter runs along the mesenteric side 
of the ilium. We typically use a 14 French catheter and find that if we snug the stapler up against that 14 French catheter, then we're generally able to catheterize it with a 16 French catheter without any resistance afterwards. Finally, we use a few stitches of 2 over 3 PDS to reinforce the ileocecal valve, strengthening the continence mechanism. We recently compared our outcomes with the CCIC compared to tunneled channels in a cohort of adult patients and found that the frequency of needing future intervention for either incontinence through the channel or difficulty catheterizing were better with the CCIC than with a tunneled channel. Thank you for listening to the presentation of these two challenging cases. In conclusion, surveillance is important in patients with catheterizable channels. It's important that they be connected with a doctor who's familiar with how to non-surgically and surgically manage the complications of continent channels. It's important to understand how to pursue a minimally invasive approach whenever you're able to. And it's also important to be familiar with a variety of surgical techniques when those are necessary. When you do get to the operating room, it can be difficult to predict which approach will be needed in individual patients, and the surgeon needs to have comfort with a broad range of surgical approaches.